Sciences Po. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you very much for coming along to the session on creating an ambitious open science action plan within a European University Alliance. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have been asked to chair this panel. It's something that's very, very important to me, open science. It's a huge priority for us at the London School of Economics, where I work. Um, I recently joined Civica because I just started my current role back in May. So when people are talking about all the achievements of LSE, I have to say they have done an incredible amount of work and I take no credit whatsoever for it because it was all before I arrived. But I'm very excited to be working with them in this next stage and with the wider alliance as well. Um, just to mention a couple of things about LSE's approach to open science, some of the things that we're working really focusing on at the moment are LSE Press, which is now five years old and going into its next phase, moving out of startup phase into really focusing on how to establish it as a really well-known, well-respected university press in its own right that can hold its own against other presses globally. Um, huge amount of work on research data management. And I was delighted last night that there was another delegate here who was talking about how useful they found the work of our research data team through Civica. And I think that proves the point of these alliances, the ability to be able to use each other's materials to help improve what's happening locally, rather than always reinventing the wheel. Um, and obviously a huge amount of research development, researcher development to ensure that people have the skills and knowledge and they need in order to be able to, it is really is a change of behavior, a change of way of working. It's a whole change of thought process. And that takes a lot of uh, researcher skills and development and networking and peer to peer learning as well. So as Civica Research concludes its current phase, um, this panel feels very, very well timed because we need to reflect on what, it, what our Civica institution is going to do in the area of open research for this next period. Um, and I believe very strongly that open science, it's a global issue. We can't solve these problems just from one university. It's not possible. So working in alliances in this way is really important. And um, I also think Civica being a social sciences alliance is a huge opportunity because so much of open science has been defined from scientific disciplines. And some of that works well for social sciences and some of it honestly doesn't. So we need to be evaluating this. We need to be speaking up. We need to be really understanding our disciplinary needs and articulating them and influencing the global discussion so that the future develop of open science is more inclusive of the needs of a wider range of disciplines. So I think that's probably enough by way of scene setting. I'm delighted today to be joined by a number of panelists. We've got Fundai Sitol, who until recently was working at LSE, and she'll be presenting first on the work of Civica. We have Pierre-Francois, who will be presenting on the work of EUNIWELL. We have Pascal Popon, who will be speaking about the work of 4EU. We have Thais Different. Did I get that right? Um, who will be speaking about the work of Utopia. And then on screen, we have Ruben Vincente Saez, who will be speaking about the work of Unite. So thank you all very much for your time. In terms of format, each panelist has been given eight minutes. We're going to be quite strict on timing, just purely because we want to get to the discussion. And Sophie is going to help us manage the times. Thank you, Sophie. Um, she will also be watching the chat online to make sure that our online attendees are able to contribute to the discussion as well. Um, on the programme, it had said 30 minute panel discussion and then 20 minute Q&A, but actually, because we were late starting in the other session, I'm going to suggest we combine those two and just take the question and answer through the panel discussion, have it as one session rather than have a break. I hope that sounds OK to everybody. And then I'm going to hand over then to our first speaker, Kundai. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. And thanks, Neve. Thank you so much all for coming. And thanks to my fellow panelists for making the way to Paris. Uh, so I'll speak uh, very briefly on the work that we've been doing within Civica uh, on open so I'll be speaking briefly on the work that we've been doing within uh, Civica on open science. The title of my presentation is Civica Open Science Community Building for a Culture Change Within the Social Sciences. And the presentation is centered around uh, three key questions. So who are we and what is our open science mission? Where are we now and what steps are being taken or have been undertaken to build a community of practice around Civica within open science? 
And to elucidate on that, I'll focus on uh, four key areas. And as I said, very quickly, because we've only got eight minutes, uh, the first of which will be the Civic Alliance Open Science Principles, which were adopted in January of this year. Uh, secondly, the annual Open Science Barometer that we've been conducting within our institutions, uh, our programme on young researcher training, and then I'll round that off with a couple of examples on sharing best practices. Um, so who are we and what is our open science mission? So you all know Civica in Alliance of Social Science uh, specific universities. We do have some humanities disciplines, but our open science mission currently is on uh, the social sciences. Um, and obviously social sciences, study of society, um, uh, how people attribute meaning to the world uh, around them. And open science speaks to uh, the manner that we conduct research uh, and encouraging that it is conducted in a way that is open, transparent, uh, accountable across the entire research life cycle phase. Um, so essentially what we're talking about is incentivizing open science research, rewarding uh, research that is done in a manner that is open, actually conducting the research uh, in a way that is open and transparent and equally disseminating it in a way that is open and transparent as well. So um, what are some of those challenges then when they apply to the social sciences? The first one obviously is methodological. Uh, much of the work that has been done on open science speaks uh, would speak uh, far more readily to the quali uh, quantitative aspects of social science, but we do also have qualitative researchers where they attribute um, a greater um, uh, importance to meaning and interpretation uh, that people attribute to the world around them. So there is that methodological aspect that we can discuss um, uh, later uh, in this morning on the panel. And uh, the other issues as well are to do with financial, making research open, costs money. Um, and uh, this isn't exclusive to the social sciences, but social sciences are, deep, are playing a bit of a catch up, if you will, when compared to the STEM subjects in regards to making research open. Other issues are to do with organizational, to what extent do the organizations actually support um, open research? So are there any strategic or operational policies in place to support open science? And is there a culture within those institutions that promotes uh, open science? So these are some of the topics that we've been grappling with and you know, we, we do invite uh, discussion on that uh, in this panel. So what is Civica doing with all of that? Um, so in January this year, uh, Civica adopted its open science principles to try and encourage and foster a community of um, practice within the urban sciences among the social science institutions. And we adopted three principles. So we have open access publishing, data sharing and inter interoperability and encouraging citizen science. Um, and uh, all of these will be accompanied by uh, knowledge transfer and uh, training uh, actions as well. But we'll discuss those uh, in more detail. Um, so that's who we are, and that's where we'd like to go to promote a co community of practice within the social sciences. But where are we now? So that is question number two. Um, in terms of where are we now, to gauge where we are, uh, we've been conducting um, annual surveys. So our open science barometer, the first one of which was in 2021, the purpose of which was to better understand the open science landscape within each civic research institution, including its commitment to the promotion of open science through policy. Uh, so we basically sent out a questionnaire to the eight uh, Civica research partners. Um, so those are the original Civica members, uh, excluding IE and SGH, to find out what they were doing in terms of policy, funding, uh, do they have any institutional repositories, uh, are they disseminating information on open science, etc. This was then followed up by a second barometer in 2022, which sort of gauge whether there'd been any changes in the 12 months uh, since the first uh, barometer to see whether people have been, um, or the institutions have been encouraging open science uh, within their de department, within the service divisions, et cetera. Um, and there, what we did notice was that there were one or two institutions that adopted uh, some policy policies, uh, that uh, spoke to open science, and I'm thinking of HERD in particular, and also greater engagement with open science training. Um, and to complement the two uh, barometers, we uh, had um, or sent out a questionnaire uh, to all of the institutions, all the civic research institutions, to find out whether they were in terms of open science training, because open science training is very much uh, a central pillar 
to the work that we are doing to try and promote a culture change and we're starting off with young researchers. So a quick questionnaire was sent out to the eight institutions to find out whether they did provide any open science training, what sort of open science training do they provide and was it well received by the junior researchers within their own institutions in particular and then also who was providing this uh, training, was it the libraries, was it, was it the research divisions, um, etc. Um, so that's uh, uh, that's the work that we did to find out um, uh, the current state of play, if you will, within the institutions. Now, moving on to the training program, this is very much central to what uh, we've been trying to do to try and promote a, a culture of um, openness in, in the research that is undertaken. So uh, we've got three pillars the Open Science Training Programme, as you can see uh, on the screen. So the pillar on the far uh, left, um, that is uh, a, uh, online courses that we curated. Um, so these are courses that are provided by institutions that are external to Civica. So FOSDA, SESTA, UK Data Services, etc. So this is basically a, uh, a list of online introductory courses that are available on the Civica website, as well as on the Civica intranet, where people can just click um, and learn a bit more about open science. Uh, it didn't feel particularly useful for us to come up with our own um, list of introductory training sessions when much of this is already available online. So we decided to make the most of what is available online, whilst we focused particularly on the, on the libraries uh, offering on open science training, and that's the column in the middle. So what we did there is this is this, pillar is very much central to open science training program. Um, we didn't devise any new programs. So what we did was to ask the libraries to open up their existing on uh, open science training. So this is training that's already being undertaken within the libraries. Uh, some of these sessions have been running for two or three years. So all they did was to change the way that they delivered them instead of face to face purely. Some of them were hybrid and some of them were moved online. Most of the hybrid ones were run by the EUI, but the rest were online. And we had 24 of those uh, during the last academic year. Um, so most of them were run during the autumn term and then spring term, and I think one or two during the summer term. And then the third pillar, uh, the, those are open science training seminars that are run within the context of the open science handbook. So to accompany the work that we're doing, um, our colleague at the LSE, Professor Patrick Dunleavy is running uh, session, uh, as, as open science uh, training sessions on um, um, how to undertake research uh, specifically for young researchers. And I'm running out of time. So the last uh, aspect uh, on the slide is to do with uh, just some examples on how we're also sharing best practices within our community. So the first one is we invite junior researchers to speak on uh, how they're engaging with open science within their own research. We also have a program where facilitators can shadow uh, experienced facilitators so that they can learn a bit more and then run their own training sessions. And this has been very successful. We can discuss that in a bit. And then the final uh, area is research data management, where we've been um, scoping who's who's providing data services and to whom within each of the institutions. Is this coming from, mean from the libraries or from the research divisions, as is the case with Bocconi uh, and so forth. So this is some of the work that we have been undertaking, and I'm just going to skip all of that and get straight to the conclusion. Um, so just some suggested next steps, um, because obviously we're at a stage now where we need to reflect on where we're going next. Um, just some examples on the screen, which I can pull up during our discussion, but um, I think I'll stop now because I think I've gone way over time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much. Kimberly. And our second speaker today is Pierre Francois from Nouvelle. Okay. 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 You hear me right? All right. Um, hi. Uh, I am Pierre Francois. I am a data librarian at uh, Nantes University. So uh, at this point, I just want to know. I don't do open science, the researchers do open science. We only give them uh, the skills, means, infrastructure they need to achieve this goal. So I think this is already important to say. Um, how, how can we do open science within Inua? This is the question. First, what's Inua? Uh, it's a higher education organization created in 2020. 
Um, and it's now for my 11 universities, started at seven, uh, under a well-being agenda, uh, which actually define uh, the research arenas uh, we are currently working on. Um, but let's speak about open science. As many of you know, um, European alliances of universities are uh, structured by tasks. And of course, this is the um, point of departure. And we have to complete this task. And this is how we are going to achieve uh, our open science objectives. Um, for the E+, we have uh, been asked to share best practices, create uh, uh, working groups, and uh, basically set up our open science principles um, from the Larry model. So basically nothing too fancy or too original uh, for, for, for that. And regarding the SWAFs tasks, it's um, basically also common. So uh, an open science study uh, for the whole alliance, sorry, I'm a bit stressed. Um, an open data management plan dedicated to annual funded projects as well as a data stewardship training program and further data pilots. Um, we are going to focus on that. Can we? Uh, yeah. Uh, because those are the tasks I'm currently working on. Okay. Uh, and we are going to focus on one aspect of this particular work package, uh, this, the open science study, because um, actually, what makes a uh, European University Alliance original is its members. And to decide what we can do as an alliance, we have obviously to know what is already going on in universities and what can be made uh, knowing each of us have different backgrounds uh, and different means to put on, on these objectives. And this has been um, kind of difficult because uh, as as some of you know, uh, we are one of the alliance which actually um, have had to face um, someone leaving a withdrawal from the alliances and the university uh, who left was actually a leading open science institution and the leader of the work package. So it has been difficult to um, renew this dynamic and uh, to get back on work. Um, but the uh, this open science study, has been a tremendous tool to um, relaunch this dynamic and uh, restructure the work and move forward. So I'm going to explain why. Uh, this is the objectives written in a grant agreement. So uh, this is technical, but it's the objectives of the studies actually to map the infrastructures, how identify, how can you position yourself, when, ser what services can you provide, to uh, make open science principle effective and implement them. Um, the, the idea is at the end to have a set of recommendation on how can we move further. And to for that, we have actually to measure what we can do and what is already in place in each university, right? So how do you, did we work? The university which actually left um, had created a survey, an open science survey, which were a bit big and complex because it's a were supposed to include every pillars of open science or, or four pillars of open science, meaning open access, research data management, open educational resources, as well as our uh, research software management. Um, so there is this huge and big complex survey um, that has been circulating into the Alliance. And of course, the completion was not uh, as effective as we wanted uh, because this survey actually requested some data some partners were unable to provide. For instance, the University of Cologne has more data to provide than the University of Kiev. It's normal. So we actually had to um, reinvent this way of assessing what do we do in open science in universities because, because we can't all provide the same data and we don't use the same indicators because the research communities and the research uh, culture is different from one country to another. And yet, if we want to do international research, we have to take 
these cultural differences and uh, structural differences into consideration. Uh, this is common sense, but it's, it's often forgotten. So it's good to say it. Plus, uh, we are uh, supposed to work as an alliance, but generally in this kind of work process, um, the leader of the core package does actually the, um, uh, the biggest part of the, uh, of the work uh, and, and we definitely needed a more open way of working um, between us. So we actually took uh, the data from this survey, but we completed it with a much more simpler tool. It's the Openers Open Science Policy Checklist. So there was not 100 cash questions, just 14 basic A, B, or C. It's a simple, straight to the point. Uh, it's, of course, it's an available tool. So we didn't have to build from scratch yet another survey, which will be circulating. So you know what I mean. Um, it is designed to assess the progress of institutions. And this is what we want. Uh, we would try to get everybody on the same point, And this is the idea. Um, so, and we actually add an open field to provide detailings because every situation is very different from one another. Uh, and what my last point is the inclusion of new partners. As we said um, earlier, we started at seven, but we are now 11. And when a university comes into an alliance, the whole process of finding someone which will be your contact person for open science uh, initiatives and purposes, it, it's, it takes some time. Um, and it takes some energy to get them in the dynamic. So it was actually one of the key points. When there's a new partner, try to get the contact person right away, try to set up a meeting with them, explain um, what are the objectives with this alliance and open science within this alliance, and try to get them on board. And guess what? It works really well. It works really well. So... Everything was completed by all quickly. Uh, this is, yeah, strictly more qualitative approach, um, but we needed further discussion for details because, oh, sorry, it's over now? Okay. <laughs> um, so just to conclude quickly, quickly, uh, open science meetups, really important is to talk between each other because this is an open science study and not an open science survey and things change very, very fast in uh, the open science landscape. So we do have to exchange in a regular basis, one time every three weeks. This is the best I can came up with. Uh, so I will try to, to, um, to keep up the pace. Uh, so it's a bit time consuming, but very, very helpful. And a new subject emerges and we can actually start building on some uh, new uh, um, some new uh, uh, missions like the setting, setting up a, a parameter for open science, assessing how um, the percentage of a publication which is actually open and try to get up uh, the level. Uh, and what about now? Well, uh, we have some recommendation which is written by everyone and not so only a single core group, uh, which has been reviewed by everyone in the working group. Uh, so this is ambitious, but this is um, uh, from uh, you know bottom up, uh, and it's it, it is now will be it will be presented uh, um, in front of annual steering committee very very soon, uh, and of course this study will be updated because there will be maybe more uh, partners to come, uh, but more uh, challenges to that lie ahead also. Um, so yeah, the, I think the key to create an ambitious uh, open science plan basically is to know what your partners can do, uh, what means do they have, and to talk to them on a regular basis to keep them in this dynamic of working together because it's the most important in an alliance to me. Thank you, sorry. Thank you, Pierre. And next we have Pascal. Uh, so hi, nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Pascal Poplin, and I'm, I'm working at the um, Sorbonne University Library, uh, who, which is part of uh, For You Plus Alliance. So For You Plus Alliance have, uh, we are involved in uh, three projects 
on open science. And today I'm I will um, I'm going to uh, to talk about uh, the third one, which aim to identify strengths and uh, weaknesses and in institutional and national uh, policies and to draw to draw up a list of good practices. So as far as the project is concerned today, I will uh, talk only uh, about uh, RDM, uh, research data management and fair data. So uh, the study was divided in four uh, parts. Uh, you can see it uh, on the screen. For each uh, of these stages, an inventory uh, was carried out and recommendations were made uh, on how the 4 uh, Alliance uh, can uh, expand its collaborations and focus on RDM services. So the first step uh, focused on uh, services dedicated to RDM uh, service, uh, services. Um, so an inventory uh, was uh, drawn up and by Ben Mash Ben March benchmarking <laughs> websites and uh, by conducting uh, interviews uh, inside the Alliance. Um, and to carry out uh, this work, the colleagues started by um, assigning uh, RGM services to each uh, stage um, of data life cycle to illustrate what kind of support is given by your RGM services. So the main difficulty uh, was to focus uh, mainly on the university level uh, due to time constraints. So they did not uh, take into account national and European um, RGM solutions. So uh, on the right, on the left, sorry, uh, you can see uh, the results of the mapping uh, for Sorbonne University and this kind of documents uh, were uh, was made for each uh, university. Uh, the main services are research innovation department, uh, research and development division, data uh, protection um, officer, uh, ethical committee, and IT service. Uh, however, wherever um, are the support services uh, dedicated um, to data entirely? and uh, who cover multiple data uh, life cycle stages. And uh, from the interviews, um, the colleagues noticed uh, that the organization around RGM uh, is uh, in the process of being uh, conducted uh, in each institution. So the recommendation is to share practices and work more closely together and they also recommended to create an interconnected uh, structure, uh, such as a uh, um, research uh, data help, help desk uh, in the universities and also across Alliance uh, members for better coordination. Uh, the second uh, stage um, focused on skills for a given stage. Uh, they lift uh, the skills required and for this work they also drew on uh, existing literature and they also conduct um, a, a workshop, they organize a workshop uh, on data roles. Uh, the study shows that the implementation um, of a uh, new job profile um, addressed um, to address emerging RGM issues uh, in the local context, and they also recommend that uh, to implement uh, data champion programs. Uh, data champion is not a data champion is not uh, a profession; is um, it's a responsibility uh, to spread uh, the culture of research data. Uh, management in institutions. And on the left, uh, you have uh, here the mapping work um, who accompanied uh, the profile descriptions. So for each um, for each uh, position, they list um, soft skills and hard skills uh, required 
here it's uh, for um, a data uh, protection officer. And the third uh, stage was to study uh, the training courses offered um, on RGM uh, for research, research staff. Um, so the benchmark was completed uh, by uh, interviews uh, with people to know um, what are the gaps in their institution uh, about uh, training RGM uh, training programs and uh, where training is most uh, need needed, for instance. Um, so the aim was to um, highlight uh, the challenges um, associated with RGM training and to identify gaps and needs. Um, the result, yes, uh, the result um, is that they found um, that even looking at uh, only at the university uh, level, uh, the training offer is uh, extensive and uh, diversified. They have observed that in most universities, um, there is a, a lack of um, ethical and legal um, training regarding RGM. And the main problem lies in finding personnel uh, able to take care of this kind of uh, training. So uh, based on the gap uh, identified, uh, they have um, develop, uh, developed a four um, lessons plan to cover uh, the missing topics. And here uh, on the left, you have an example. So the topics were legal issue, intellectual property, uh, GDPR, personal data and anonymization, data security and uh, ethics. And the recommendation is uh, is that uh, it may be interesting uh, to share some session in order to benefit from the speciality of each member uh, of the Alliance. And in addition, uh, a joint program or a summer school could be uh, interesting to, to be organized. And the last step, sorry, I have to speed up. Uh, the last step uh, was uh, to study uh, the RGM uh, repositories. Uh, so they, li they, li they list and described um, RGM repository uh, used by each member, uh, thanks to a benchmark and bilateral um, meetings. And they analyzed that um, um, uh, in fact, they made a list of uh, existing data repositories and funding solutions. And for the majority of the university, um, we utilize, we utilize uh, the Dataverse platform uh, for our data repositories, uh, allowing for DOI uh, assignments and supporting various types uh, of data sets. Uh, they also made a list um, of uh, funding solutions used within the university, uh, internal budget allocations, but also um, European Union fundings and uh, national fundings. And they also notice, notice that a long-term preservation plan is not always uh, in place. So their recommendations um, is to support the creation uh, and maintenance of each partner's uh, data repository, uh, because not uh, all the university have uh, data repository. And they also um, stress the fact that um, it can be it cannot be done done um, without a long term uh, preservation uh, maintenance, a long term maintenance. Uh, okay, I'm done here. So the, this project is a, a trend for you uh, project. It's an uh, age 2020 uh, project. So it focuses uh, very much on the forward uh, looking uh, aspects. And uh, the report uh, produced um, by my colleagues, uh, Merich here, um, was shared uh, within the Alliance. And it is also available to other uh, European alliance. 
And uh, now we need um, a second round of funding uh, to move on the practical phase. Thank you, Pascal. And next we have Thais. Good morning, everyone. Everyone can hear me. Uh, so my name is Thijs de Vriend, and I work at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel in uh, in Belgium. Uh, what I do at the at the VUB is I'm a science policy officer, and I focus on two topics. So the first topic is to implement um, uh, sorry financial and reputational incentives at different levels of research evaluation, and the second topic that I focus on is the implementation of uh, generative AI uh, into research processes and yeah, into the research workflow. Um, the work that I've been doing uh, on open science has been within the Utopia uh, project. So Utopia is an alliance of um, 10 different research institutions. Uh, what is important to note is that the research institutions um, have all kinds of faculties. So it's not focused on one uh, research area. And I have been leading the work within uh, Utopia Train, which is now coming to a close, and Utopia More. I also have to say that uh, I took over um, this job from another person who has done a lot of work on the Utopia train, so it wouldn't be fair for me to take credit for every, everything that I will show. <laughs> okay. So just go over what we realized within Utopia train. So first we created uh, training materials on open science. This includes um, training materials on reproducibility. So introducing researchers to the concept of uh, reproducibility how to find data, data repositories, how to curate your metadata, what the whole, um, how to change uh, reward systems with indicators and metrics on open science. And I'm glad to say that um, most of these materials have been made publicly available in the summer last year. And since then, they've been downloaded more than a thousand times. So we think that uh, the uptake of these materials uh, has been quite good. Then what we have also done is we have um, established a common utopia portal for research outputs in open air and the easy way to understand this is that it's an index for uh, that open air is kind of like an index or a database for all kinds of uh, research outputs coming from the different um, from the 10 partner institutions in utopia and i will go more in detail on this later then we have also developed a framework policy on research assessment, and the framework policy is kind of the strategy of the Utopia institutions to reform research assessments. It's a bit comparable to um, the Coara agreement, except it's uh, on, on a smaller scale. Um, and then we also have um, some support actions um, on citizen science. I'm not also in the lead for this. This is a, a colleague of me uh, at my institution. But here we have uh, developed workshops on citizen science, a handbook on citizen science. And we're trying to teach um, yeah, the, the researchers at the different uh, Utopia institutions how they can uh, execute a proper citizen science project. So focus on uh, open air. So what, what can we do with open air? So if we speak about open air, we must first uh, yeah, be precise what we exactly, exactly are talking about. So there's three different things. The first is uh, open air explore, which is the, let's say the comprehensive uh, yeah, data set um, or index of all kinds of research outputs coming from um, yeah, many different institutions. And as you can see, there's yeah, 170 uh, million publications and so on. Then we have the Utopia portal, which is basically all the institutions that don't belong to Utopia filtered out, and we only collect the research outputs of Utopia. And then we have the open air monitoring service, and the open air mon monitoring service is a dashboard when you, where you can, um, yeah, let's say, collect indicators and metrics on different open science activities. So this might include the degree of openness or fairness of data sets. Okay, yeah, this is what the portal looks like uh, in open air. So this is for the Utopia Alliance. You can see there's uh, more than 700,000 publications in there, uh, almost 30,000 uh, research data sets and so on. Then uh, this is the Utopia uh, monitor dashboard. So this is really in full development, but as you can see on the left side, we can choose uh, different types of research outputs, publications, software, data sets, and then we can see, okay, what's the progress in terms of open access of these um, uh, um, yeah, uh, research outputs or the fairness of these research outputs. 
Um, I'm just showing you one slide here, but this is being updated quite regularly. And then we can see new metrics on all these outputs. So yeah, the state of affairs is that we have only established this portal at the end of last year. Um, at the moment, this increases the visibility of research outputs for Utopia. Um, but the reality is that what really creates the added value for the Utopia monitoring service is the, the extra services that you put on top of the index, okay? So here we are still in discussion with the different partners on what we exactly want to do for Utopia and how we also can get a lot of benefits out of it for our individual institutions. So there's no agree, there's no not agreement, a lot of agreement on this yet, but I would just go over what is possible according to us with this. So one of the things that we at VUB would be quite interested in is um, to develop open science indicators on data and software. This is because um, our university uh, library actually in, um, provides information to open air, um, yeah, where, where then it is uh, put into the index. So this means that if we, for instance, as a university would uh, yeah, ask researchers to upload all their data sets into our local repository, that this is fed into open air, and then we can do uh, the collecting of this, um, or yeah, the, let's say collecting different indicators on open science activities in, uh, in open air itself. This means that we also don't have to do it on the basis of our local, uh, you know, uh, and of, our, of our pure system, basically. Um, then there is also a project in beta, which is to link different research outputs to sustainable development goals uh, within open air. Um, another thing that we uh, would be quite interested in is to yeah, link different um, indicators on open science to research groups within our institution. So one way of doing, it, of doing this would be to add to the metadata in our pure system, which research group that um, a certain output belongs to, then to feed it into open air, then to have open air also accept uh, this new information, and then to collect the indicators on the level of the group. So we can see the progress, we can actually monitor progress uh, on, open, on this open science dimension through time. Um, and then academic profile matching we would be quite interested in, but that's uh, quite a difficult thing to be honest. And then uh, there's also uh, the option to have uh, different data management plan tools being offered uh, through open air. Uh, this is, um, we focus less on this at the VUB level, but some other partners are interested in this. And I would be very, very willing to discuss uh, in this panel section, what different people think that uh, open air could offer for them. So. Yeah, this is just an example of the sustainable uh, development goals. So that was my short presentation. Oh, yes. Who's the next speaker? <laughs> is it please? Thank you, Thais. And that's the last of our in-person speakers. Oh. So we move to Ruben, who's hopefully still with us online. Hello. Yes, I think that uh, you can see now my slides. Yes. Very good. Okay, very good. So, well, uh, first of all, uh, bonjour, uh, Paris. Uh, salut from Finland, uh, from Helsinki. So, merci bien pour, uh, uh, for, for this opportunity, for being here today, for um, learning from all of you, uh, for sharing uh, these best practices. And, uh, and well, uh, it has been a, a very, very, very uh, great to know uh, all the progress that uh, you have been done. And uh, well, this is a great opportunity indeed for uh, for sharing this progress, no, mate, on 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 how we are creating these uh, open science and innovation universities in the past three years, and also uh, inviting you as well to join efforts and build collaboration among all uh, our European universities alliances. So I'm Ruben Vicente. I'm postdoctoral researcher in open science management at the Department of Industrial Engineering uh, and Management an Alto University, and also I've been coordinating, uh, well, this uh, group that we have at Alliance level, Unite Alliance Working Group on Open Science and Innovation. So we are a transversal and transdisciplinary research group uh, of uh, researchers, also support services, uh, open science support services, librarians as well, and also uh, university managers across uh, well, our nine uh, partner universities. Uh, this project was set up between seven. Currently, we are nine. And well, what are the dynamics of open science in the digital era? And 
how do we design, perform, share and assess research compared to 20 years ago? So we have been uh, exploring these uh, questions and especially we have been exploring how can the institution of open science be articulated within the context of the European Universities Alliance? With our working group, we aim it to answer these questions. And how? Uh, first, by identifying and mainstreaming these best practices of open science and, in and innovation across the whole alliance. Second, by outlining foundations for the development of this new university, open science and innovation governance model and policy. And finally, by exploring how this model contributes to the solving of the big societal challenges that we have in front of us, like the climate change, and also can be a scale up at the European level. So how? How we are uh, accomplishing, accomplishing these goals? Well, we are developing key strategic tools and policy guidelines. Working Packet 6 is a transversal working group, a bottom-up uh, working group, uh, in the especially in the context of the policy. And then we have also within the Alliance, the action working packages that they have been in green as well, the uh, open science, uh, pre the open science principles and practices. So in 2021, our working group uh, developed, uh, well, this is strategic and a strategic roadmap in open science and innovation. And we set up uh, five objectives for university managers and policy makers advancing the adoption of these open science uh, practices across the Unite uh, uh, University alliances. Uh, all these objectives, uh, developing open science policies and open science strategies, enhancing the opening up of digital and physical infrastructures, promoting open science support services at our universities, fostering open science in careers, and also improving open science competencies, embrace the UNESCO recommendation of open science. So it's also our position as an alliance to the UNESCO. So, and what is uh, what what is next? What it was next? So we are very glad uh, of presenting today before its publication in November, our Unite Handbook of Best Practices for Effective Mainstreaming of Open Science and Innovation at our universities a handbook for facilitating the transition from modern science to open science. So in 2022, using Unite Alliance as a test bed, we conduct a comprehensive case study of 70 research teams. Research teams from all the disciplines of science, business, design, engineering, technology, architecture, and also humanities at Unite Universities. And very important, by following also a very radical creativity approach, a bottom-up approach. We don't tell the researchers from a top-down approach how to conduct open science with this handbook. The, based on this comparative case study, based on all the interviews, the explorations, the physical explorations of the of the infrastructures, and also the, the the meetings with the team members of the research uh, in these research teams, the researchers share with us and explain us how they conduct open science. So, this handbook provides a high impact understanding of these best open science practices across Unite, and well, we reveal the state of art, the what, the why, the when, and the where these pioneering researchers that, that are across our universities are adopting this open sharing and also collaborative practices because open science follows two dynamics in the digital era, the openness in the sharing of knowledge and also the openness in the creation of knowledge. And well, we provide a very comprehensive taxonomy of these practices, but also the state of art on how these open science practices, because we have been exploring the link between open science and innovation, are expanding the rationales of knowledge valorization 
transfer and intellectual property at our universities and how these novel open science practices are also bringing new open innovation practices that we refer as open exploration practices. So this handbook also presents practical guidelines on how researchers can adopt these practices based on the primary analysis of these practices together with the secondary analysis uh, of the secondary of the, with analysis of the secondary source of information uh, such university guidelines national policies we outline practical guidelines or as we call as well as standards a standards for how to adopt these uh, open science practices and innovation practices as you can see here and well finally drawing on the fundings of this comparative case study we present a new university governance model for the management of research and innovation with these novel open science and innovation practices. First, this governal model illustrates how university uh, researchers are managing, can manage these open sharing practices, such as open protocol sharing, open data sharing, open source research sharing, open multimedia sharing, but also the open collaborative practices, such interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and recombining also open science outputs. This model also, uh, well, we are aiming that it's a tool for uh, support the design of university uh, support services for the adoption of these practices. And finally, this governance model also, we are aiming that supports university managers uh, when developing uh, different uh, strategies, policies, uh, actions, and, and redesigns for the effective administration of open science and innovation. So through mutual learning and identification of these good practices, we are aiming and we have been developing these uh, policy recommendations and guidelines uh, for the modernization of research and innovation uh, at the universities in the digital era. So, well, Open science is not a fancy tech slogan. And uh, well, it implies these new philosophical, sociological, and also organizational principles and goals. So the pilot phase of our alliances is now ending. And from 2024, we will start another. So today I want to take also this opportunity. Uh, thanks for organizing this event because, well, we would like to invite you as well uh, to, co to build collaboration among our university, university, European University alliances, because we have now the beautiful opportunity with the Waidera phase, the Waidera projects, for going beyond of all this great work that we have been conducted at our, our universities and, uh, and within our alliances. And we have the opportunity of building this collaboration and exploring together uh, well, the presence of this institution of science to build our open and democratic uh, future as European universities. So thank you, Kitos Palion, merci beaucoup. Thank you, Ruben, and thank you to all of our speakers this morning. So really interesting thoughts. I'm going to come to questions pretty rapidly. So while you're formulating those, uh, just to pull out a couple of things that I was hearing through that. It sounds like we're working on very similar themes, which is really positive. We're not all going off in a million different directions. That's always reassuring. Um, I'm hearing a lot of thoughtfulness about reviewing what we're already doing, what of that can we share, and then where can we add value? So again, people are explicitly avoiding reinventing the wheel. Again, this makes me very happy. <laughs> Um, I'm hearing observations about the challenges of balancing different national priorities within the context of what's going on. Um, I'm hearing, I mean, we all know open research is really rapid change all the time, isn't it? And the importance of communications with that and making sure everybody's on board with what you're trying to do. And I'm hearing a huge emphasis on skills. And I'm also hearing a huge emphasis on the position of researchers within this and the importance of the researchers. Ruben was making that point there very clearly the importance of researchers describing how it's going to work for them and us then, for those of us in, in roles that support that, working out how to meet that need. So I'm going to check with Sophie first whether we have any online questions so far. No? 
Okay, and anybody in the room? Does anybody have Susanna? Uh, thank you very much, Glenn Morata from MIT. Um, I was like you, uh, in the I, I wonder if that sounded intriguing. So I'm just sorry, uh, Ruben. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's better. Uh, you mentioned uh, novel open innovation practices, and I I just wondered if you could explain or give some examples of exactly what that is. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, what we have been encountering, uh, and also because we have here very great uh, colleagues also working on the data management, for instance, we have encountering that uh, when adopting as well and revealing, for instance, open data and adopting these practices uh, and publishing, for instance, in, a, in, in databases, uh, we have and simultaneously also achieving uh, this, uh, well, knowledge transfer. This data is not only, for instance, used for research purposes. No, it's also being used for uh, developing, uh, well, different apps, different, you know, for instance, uh, software. So the borders between science and innovation are, are not clear. So we have seen how they are expanding, no? And this is also what we call, for instance, uh, recombining open science outputs, no? It's one of the clear practices on, 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 on that starts uh, as an open science practices, but now uh, they they are questioning. They are uh, they are um, well. Uh, they are bringing a new definition of this innovation at our universities and how we really need new policies for uh, taking into account this uh, this new reality. This is, for instance, one of the examples that we have. But also, in when we are uh, collabor collaborating with the citizens. Thank you. What we even. call disciplinary thinking. research. Yeah. Thank no. you. And in case um, the people online didn't hear the first part of the question as well, there was also a question for Thais um, about yes. the use of open air for impact monitoring. Yes. So um, the section on impact in open air is something that has been um, recently added. So we have not focused on it as much. However, um, at my institution, and I think both in Belgium and the Netherlands, there has been a long tradition of uh, scientometrics studies, right? So, and we have a group um, at our university that is also focusing on um, quantifying research impact. So one of the ways that we could proceed with, uh, you know, if we decide that um, we want to collect these indicators on the level of open air is to sit together with the local group we had have at the VUB and then to go talk to the open air people and ask them about the exact methodology of how they are uh, trying to quantify impact. So I have to say I have not looked at it in, in as much detail right now. Um, our primary focus has been on uh, quantifying data sharing for now because for the, for the easiest step is basically um, open access publications and preprints, every, everything related to that, that. And the next step, I think, is uh, data sharing, quantifying data sharing, openness of data, fairness of data, and so on. Thank you. Can, can I just ask, so the open air monitor is something that uh, it, it's a, 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 an available software that you purchase or is something you developed? Okay, so it has been, um, we have work, so it, open air is an organization that uh, is funded through the European Union. Okay, so far they have been working um, just purely based on funding that they got from the European level. However, in the near future, they will have to transition to a pay for service model. Okay, so we have asked them about the price that we are going to have to pay next year. And it's very low. So it's between uh, the initial estimation was between 500 and 1000 euros for an individual university on a yearly basis. Well, this is very, very, very cheap for us. If we look at um, what we are paying for um, the pure service, so uh, offered by Elsevier, uh, we are paying quite a bit more. And it would be actually quite interesting to see uh, for us um, some of the, um, how do I call it? There's some modules that Elsevier is developing that I have taken a look at and I'm not... Um, fully satisfied with how they work. I think they're sometimes quite limited when we look at measuring open science dimensions. So one thing that would be interesting for us is to uh, sit together with the expert that we have on Pure uh, to look at whether we can add extra metadata uh, fields in the Pure database. Then we send uh, the information from the Pure database to the library and then it feeds into OpenAir. And then to sit together with the OpenAir people and see um, how can we exactly quantify data sharing in such a way that it makes sense for our university eh, to um, 
mo to monitor the progress in the long term of each research group, but also at the university level. And I just want to add one more thing on this. And this is that um, uh, I know that some countries have initiatives at the national level where they try to do the monitoring, but in uh, Flanders, it's not for the moment. Um, uh, it's not progressing uh, rapidly enough, I think, and so open air might be a, a nice option before there is uh, mon monitoring on the national level. Thanks very much, Thais. I can see that Sophie has taken the microphone, so yeah. I think we must have an online question. So I take the opportunity of this first question to address another question regarding the open air portal. So this is coming from Daniela Zuluaga from Uniwell uh, Alliance. So how was the process of curating the research outputs to be uploaded uh, to open air? And if you could elaborate a bit more regarding the decision-making process behind this initiative. Yeah, so I'm sorry to say that this is a bit before my time. <laughs> so this was uh, the preparatory work that was done in the beginning of last year. Um, and it's also the library services of the VUB that have been responsible for doing it at our university and I'm part of a different team. I'm part of the data management and yeah, like infrastructure team. So I can't re uh, respond that very well, sorry for that. Can I just check if anybody else on the panel has had similar decision-making processes that they might want to comment on perhaps? And if not, open air, no. No, um, okay, anybody? We are using the French Open Science Monitor. Yeah. Okay, so um, so just an observation that um, at Sorbonne, they're using the French Open Science Monitor. Um, okay, uh, did you have other online questions then, Sophie? No, it was just to say that uh, maybe we have we can get in touch uh, all the alliances because as Kunda can tell also, we have this open air portal for the mm -hmm. Civica Alliance. Uh, in our roadmap for open science mm -hmm. next year. <laughs> yes, we do indeed. Okay, are there other questions from the room for any of our panelists? Susanna. Um, I, I think all um, speakers talked about training and the training available at your institutions. I was curious to know about the uptake of the training. I think one of you said it was sort of a thousand downloads, but I mean, how significant is that? Um, um, so I, I, I suppose I wanted to know more in relative terms, was the uptake large or small compared to other training that is on offer for the social, for the open science training materials in your um, sort of um, institutions, in your alliances? Thank you. I'm going to suggest we start with some of the panelists who haven't spoken yet. So Kundai, do you want to come in at this point? Sure. So with... Uh, so <laughs> Thank you. So uh, with uh, Civica, what we notice is that um, over the course of the first term, so uh, September 2022 to December 2022, uh, we had uh, 10 sessions on offer, a total of 828 people um, registered on Eventbrite. We use Eventbrite to um, uh, uh, promote our training sessions. Of those 828 registrants, 423, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been crunching the numbers, you can tell. <laughs> 423 um, actually um, uh, attended uh, either online or in person for our hybrid sessions. So that's about 50%, uh, uh, roughly. Uh, same levels again for the second semester. So that was from, I think, it was towards the end of January 2023 to the end of March 2023. We had four. 423, I think, um, attendees, uh, sorry, uh, registrants for our, how many were they? Six sessions. Um, and uh, of those 423 registrants, 254, if I remember correctly, um, actually attended either in person for the hybrid sessions or online. So there again, about 50% or um, uh, just over. In terms of the breakdown of who was actually attending, um, our training sessions are open to everyone. So although they're pitched to a civic audience, um, they are available to a global audience. And we have had 
quite a lot of uptake for reasons that I cannot understand from Southeast Asia, um, which is is brilliant. Uh, so um, you know, open science is is quite a thing in Southeast Asia. But we do have attendees as well from uh, Africa. We've had Nigeria, Botswana, Canada, United States, uh, non uh, civica institutions in Europe. Um, and uh, if we do a breakdown by um, uh, uh, faculty level, research level, quite a number of PhD students, because those are obviously our target audiences. We've also had a number of um, senior uh, established uh, faculty members. I'm thinking, for example, a former uh, pro vice chancellor of research at Bocconi, uh, who emailed saying, this is a fantastic program, can I come along to your sessions? Um, without necessarily having to register. Um, so there is interest uh, across the board, but our um, pitch is mainly to young researchers. We also have quite a number of uh, library and research support services uh, staff who do attend our sessions. And we notice that where we do have specific sessions on um, research ethics, we do have a number of um, individuals who sit on research uh, research ethics boards uh, who, who do attend. We've had a couple from Bocconi as well. Thank you. I am very impressed. I am not good at statistics. I'm, I'm good at statistics, but I can't remember them. I can't believe you managed to pull that up. Well done, <laughs> could I? <laughs> um, Pierre, would you like to add any observations about the training? Jacob? Uh, yeah, regarding the, the, um, the training offers uh, at an alliance level, um, what uh, we want to do actually is um, like we figured out that we have some training materials like videos, um, stuff like that available, uh, which can we, we can make accessible and available for the whole alliance. So the content is um, is not really the uh, the issue, um, but the issue is um, the support staff in the University of Cologne is not the same support staff at the University of Murcia is not the same support staff at uh, the University of Semmelweis in Budapest. Uh, every university has its own um, uh, its own means for support staff, mm -hmm. and uh, what we want to do is to provide a, a database, a knowledge database that will help universities that don't provide this kind of su su support to uh, have the means to provide it to the researchers, uh, because even if the content is here. Uh, you can share if you have actually to um, train the trainer. So this is actually what we, we want to do for this uh, specific issue is to gather everything we had, uh, uh, we have on a single database, mm -hmm. but also providing uh, the support staff, the libraries for uh, all the Alliance uh, with this specific materials and help them to um, build their support units for researchers and PhD, because that's what they need the most to achieve uh, open science uh, and, and research data management and opening uh, goals. Thank you. Um, Pascal, Pace, or Ruben, would any of you want to comment on that one as well? Uh, yes, we also have, sorry, we also have uh, training courses at uh, Alliance level. Um, last year, it was the second uh, cycle. It was better than the first one uh, because we tried to be more practical uh, with um, training sessions, such as uh, how to search uh, open access work online or how to create a real or arch archived uh, ID. And we try uh, also to make uh, the webinar um, live here <clears throat> with the interview from researchers, for instance. Yeah. And we had uh, average um, 160 uh, participants, attendees per session. I have to say these figures are very, very impressive. And yeah. having, having run many open science sessions at the University of Cambridge, which would have been internal mainly, hearing the kinds of numbers that are coming out here when you open it up globally in this way, <laughs> they really are very impressive. Um, Thais, did you want to say anything? Yeah, so very quickly, for us, the numbers were uh, quite a bit higher than what we anticipated. And what is interesting, if you look at uh, Orzinodo portal, is that the number of views, um, if the number of views is 100%, then the number of downloads is about 80%. Sometimes you see with the data sets and so on that there's lots of page visits, yeah, but nobody down or few people downloads them. And for us, it seems that many people are really looking into the material um, 
And uh, aside from that, I want to say that we are using this for internal training. So whatever we develop at Utopia level, we use for internal training. And now we have a continuation project of Utopia Train, so which is called um, Utopia More. And there we are also using the materials that we have already developed. So yeah, the, the uptake is uh, increasing in this way. That's brilliant. And Ruben, did you want to say anything? Yeah, so I mean, uh, in our case, I mean, uh, we have a, a very great uh, here colleagues as well that uh, at Alto that they have been the open science unit. They are working as well in support uh, in the support services, like supporting all the researchers and also training the staff, providing all the coaching as well on on how to adopt the open science practices. And these courses have been also uh, offered to all the colleagues in the in the at that alliance level. And uh, I don't remember now the figures, but I knew that uh, in the last sessions, 40% of the participants belong as well to the Unite, uh, the Unite uh, Universities. And uh, mostly were as well uh, staff that they are as well now uh, developing their own support services at, uh, at uh, their universities. So they, this training, this training uh, had been uh, very useful for that. And they are available as well for everyone who wants to learn and wants to uh, work with open science practice. This is, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking all of our panelists once more for, I think, what's been a really interesting, um, inspiring session. It's very impressive how much has been achieved across Europe through these alliances. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what comes in future. I'm going to suggest that we stop here so that you get time for a break and network. But please, I imagine all the speakers will be very happy to be contacted, I assume, including Ruben, even, yes. Uh, so please do get in touch either here in person or online if you have follow-up questions. So thank you, everyone.